Raw Dogs, Awu. Happy holidays to you guys out there in Don't Worry About the Government Patreon land. I am taping here on Christmas Eve because at about 8 p.m. last night, there was a power outage. And when the power goes out, I have like two candles here. I normally have more candles so that the power can go out and I can still do some stuff around the house, like play guitar. And I, I just, I like candles anyways. And they are handy when the power goes out. But I only had a couple last night. And Chesterfield Cat, as I was reminded, is scared of the dark. So I lit the candles and then Chesterfield was attached to my hip. And when the power's out, oh, by the way, like, it's cold outside, so the temperature starts slowly dropping. Um, So me and the cat fam huddled up in the bed back there and napped out. And it's now four in the morning on Christmas Eve as I am taping this. I wanted to get something out. December is always a weird time in don't worry about the government like production schedules going back at, at, for as long as I have been a part of this show. Um, I just do family stuff and, you know, it's December. It's like the end of the year and like it's cold and you don't want to do shit. December reasons for not doing things, as you might imagine. I mean, I'm drinking apple cider. Nothing is more December. Maybe eggnog. I've got eggnog downstairs for the coffee. Um, but apple cider and then eggnog. You, you're you're just really in December territory. Mm. Fantastic shit. And so another thing I got done this month here is the guitars. I, I have the entire guitar arsenal behind me here. Over the last... I'd say the last year, but like some of these projects are going back now a year and a half or two years. I've slowly been tweaking out everything. So like, here, let's do the rundown. This bass, um, I discovered that the pickups on this thing just suck. Like they, they were ass. Um, they were super staticky and noisy. I had done all this work inside uh, the control cavity back here. And like, well, I, at that point, I didn't really know how to do a lot of this stuff. So John was doing all that shit. Um, but we had done work on all this shit. And that wasn't the issue. The issue was actually ultimately these pickups. I changed those out. This thing kicks ass now. It sounds really good. Uh, I've got these Line 6 Variaxes. It's kind of a shame because I was more into these like three years ago. And I love this concept. They've got like a little computer on board. If you can see, they've got like this knob and I can go through all these different banks of guitar settings and I upgraded the pickups because on the standard ones they kind of suck and this actually has an American Strat neck on it oh yeah it's really good it's, this is a 93 neck um and yeah like the, the body's beat up it doesn't matter like it, it is a black guitar that has the computer stuff on it um i got really into this concept i really liked these ideas so i actually made like an even cooler version of basically that same concept um this is a warmoth custom made neck this is such a cool neck it is a uh goncalo alves fretboard on a toasted maple neck there you can kind of see all four different wood grains you can see the body and you can see the cap and you can see the neck and then you can see the uh, fingerboard really cool um the I, I need to go back in and retweak what i was doing on the banks um and that can be a process which is the one thing i don't like about it uh the other thing i did is i upgraded the battery supplies on these guys so i can now flip in two batteries real quick i don't have to wire it into a board i fucking hate that that was the thing that i i, I could not stand and one battery these things chug through. So that, that actually made a big difference. Um, this is my first guitar, my very first guitar. I've been playing this 20 years now. A PV Falcon Special. Uh, I, t I did not realize that, that there was a Falcon Special, but there's a standard Falcon. They're kind of ugly. Um, the Special's kind of cool looking, right? Uh, 
when I got it, it had gold hardware. Uh, apparently, it doesn't have that stock. I don't think. I I don't know. I've changed so many things on this. Um, I've upgraded the frets. I put in these pickups. These are Area Fifty Ones and a hot rail. Uh, don't quote me on that. Um, but more importantly, it's got a series and parallel switcher here, which is cool. Standard five channel. We've got a kill switch, which is dope. Um, that only engages though when I pull this up, which is even more dope. And the last thing that needed to get done on this. And then, drum roll, please. Th this this control cavity is a fucking mess. In case you're wondering, as I'm explaining all this, Fugazi sticker. Yeah, that's right. Not not authorized by the band. This has been on here since the year 2000. Um, so then when you pop this puppy up, boom, you're boosting the front end of the amp or your pedal board or whatever. So if like you're soloing, like, I, I don't know, let's say you want to do leads, um, this guy, uh, and you want to be fucking louder or have more gain because you can never have enough gain. That isn't that the truth. Every guitar player knows I'm right. Um, this actually engages a DiMarzio boost circuit that's in the control cavity of this thing, um, which sounds really, really cool running through like my tube screamer circuit because that has the 50% clean and then 50% of the actual distortion thing. Well, you're pushing the front end of that even more. So like you've got the pushed front end plus the push distortion end. And so you it like really, really rips a tube screamer. Um, it's cool as shit. We've got the Rickenbacker 330. Oh, geez. Don't run away. You're not allowed to go anywhere. I'm gonna I'm getting to you. I'm getting to you. See, that's rude. That is that is the rudest thing. A guitar that just runs off on you. Um, all right, so this is my Rickenbacker 330. Uh I took out the faceplate. Uh, I like the faceplate, and then I started looking at the font one day and I decided I hate the font. Also, it's much easier to get access to the truss rods, and I just, when you have as many guitars as I do, you don't necessarily want to be unscrewing covers when you're doing maintenance. Um, you go, oh, it's just one cover. Yeah, look at how many guitars there are. Do you really want to be unscrewing all those covers? I don't. Um, also, my the it, it's a pain in the ass. There's like three on this one. It, I, it's stupid. Um, plus, when you take off the cover... People don't know what this guitar is, which I think is very weird because, like, literally, there's there's an R. I mean, anyways, um, what I did with this is instead of using the blend knob as a blend knob anymore, which is kind of a cool idea, kind of a cool idea. Um, what what I did is I put in a humbucker here at the bridge to make it louder and then moved these two pickups up and what this does is it engages different caps and moves it through like series and parallel and like a, a number of different things with bass cuts when you go into those different settings so when you go into higher gains you've got that and then this is still just your standard three channel switcher bridge bridge in this guy this guy and this guy's something like that I, and then uh, John had it, hilariously an Eddie Van Halen speed knob. So th this guy, you can actually speed knob, would, but I, I don't know why you would. Um, it, it, and I can't because uh, it's, it's with the guard there and everything. It's inconvenient. And I mean, why would I take off the guard? The, the guard's cool. You can, the guard is cool. And I don't think there's any mechanical advantage gained by removing the guard. I'm looking at it. I'm looking at it. I'm thinking about it. We cannot possibly entertain removing the guard. That, that, no, no, no. This is my life. This is my life. We have the vintage T60. Nothing really to this other than I redid the frets. Um, I mean, like, you get a vintage guitar. I could have kept the frets, frets stock, but they were low, and I hate low frets. I really hate low frets. And, like... Because with low frets, you can't do a lot in terms of maintenance. So when they were gonna, they were gonna have to go. You can't really recrown them. You can't really pluck them. So I'd rather just put in new frets. I tend to go with higher frets, anyways. That is my whole thing. Love the micro tilt on this neck. Um, like, 
but I needed to redo the action on it. Um, but I have not even touched the truss rod. I just used the micro tilt and then I adjust the saddles down here. Um, so I'm not even playing around with the, the neck actual bend or anything like that. It's the only like real cosmetic blemish on this guy is right here. Um, and it doesn't even look bad. It's just like the finish is sort of worn away a little bit. It, I mean, like the actual wood and everything is good. I, I, I just can't like, I can't get over it. Um, I got this thing for under $500. Um, it is, it's cool. Uh, cool, ash, heavy. Not as heavy as like all the message boards say, but that's also like different guitars are like that. It's kind of like this guy here, um, which is quickly moving up the ranks of my favorite guitars, my SG, uh, which I've put in new pickups on. So you've got the Saturday Night Special on here, and then you've got the Fat Cat P90. Gives me a little bit more of a trebly sound when I'm doing like nines and stuff. It, it's not muddy. Man, the uh, the standard humbucker in here is just, ugh. It is okay in certain gain settings, but clean is not one of them. And not having clean, I find to be deeply annoying because i know how to step up gain to make anything that is like a, a fat like a p90 or a standard humbucker i know how to take the pedals down there and make it into distortion right like crunch and chug um it, it, anything I'm, this i don't have the pedals for but I'm, or the amp for i guess is more the better, better way of putting that one but like that with the Saturday Night Special in there, that thing could gent if you wanted it to, um, and you set it up with fatter strings and then a lower tuning. I, it'd be interesting. Now I've got my brain thinking about like, what if you did be standard? No, no. I we're probably not gonna do that today. Probably not gonna do that today. Uh, but but a thing now that my brain thinks about. Um, so yeah, that's the tour. Oh. And then back there, the I don't, I don't know. Have we have we ever pulled this guy out? This thing. Now that I have, now that I have a looper pedal, this is the one everyone goes ape over. Um, because though it is okay, one, it's kind of like the Brian Jones guitar. Uh, which it's actually that's this is the Brian Jones style guitar where he's playing on the Apache. Um, and they made a guitar version of this, but I didn't want that. I wanted the bass version and this even has like a little you can bring the tempo up not the easiest deck in the world to play because i haven't like redone the frets or anything like that I've, it's it's a box apache base <laughs> like i didn't pay that much money for it these are discontinued though so if you one these things are getting like stupid expensive people like really covet these um i'm not saying that as like a flashy thing because i bought this just because i thought it was going to be functional and it is um but i also when i saw that it was discontinued i was like uh i know how the market can be on these sorts of things um and I, i've been born out to be right but you can get a ha your hands on this um they are very cool and then i suppose if you could get a neck replacement on this uh and just put on a really cool neck uh, on this thing a little short scale cool neck these things really cook uh and i i don't you know I don't, when i'm playing with it, i don't run through this run it through the amp sounds really really good like on my my big my big uh tnt back there this thing sounds good it's cool all right so uh that is the tour of the guitars in case you were wondering uh, about the guitars now you know and that'll get us into today's episode which has nothing to do with guitars sadly but makes sense because trump uh is a soulless man and would not probably be any good at actually playing music uh let's let's take a look at the show slide 
why don't we? Um, so here we are. Boom. I'm going to expand out this window, I think. Can I do it? Can I do it? I'm doing it. It is done. All right. So, yeah, twas the night before Christmas, and we're going to be talking about weird shit that Trump's been doing to close out his administration. Uh, and, and there has been a lot of weird shit. D don't let the uh, <laughs> don't let the reporting fool you, people. Uh, the the shit has been quite weird, and we're gonna get into all of that. Most importantly, we're gonna talk about the pardons, though, because I think there is a lot to be gleaned about who Donald Trump is, what this presidency has been all about, and where we are at as like the state of the country and, and you know kind of gets into my broader critique of bidenism which is less of a even like left or progressive thing and more of a like well you'll just hear it when we get into the pardons I, I mean i don't know how you can listen to what trump's done with regards to the pardons and not think that we're a nation that's in real trouble i'm not even going to talk about the election release the kraken being done by the karen uh sydney powell who was back at the white house this week like this is part of a long-term strategy although it does look like trump's planning on abandoning ship here uh, or, or certainly hedging his bets with these pardons but it's not good that we have a, a majority of the republican party thinking this election was stolen from them when the Electoral College advantages their candidate and they still managed to lose in the Electoral College and lost in the popular vote by 7 million, they tried to get Amy Coney Barrett on the Supreme Court so as to have this case be heard at the Supreme Court and have the Supreme Court overturn the election. And if you don't think that that was Trump's strategy in putting Amy Coney Barrett onto the Supreme Court, it doesn't make any sense in any other way to interpret what Sidney Powell's been doing on behalf of Trump in the last month and a half than to think that, like, obviously Amy Coney Barrett in the Supreme Court was part of his long-term strategy here. He wanted to maybe challenge the results of the election and challenge them up to the Supreme Court, and the hope was by putting in the Supreme Court justice, look at he split before the election— he would be able to get that case heard, and then he would win that case because he has a 6-3 majority on the Supreme Court because the Supreme Court's a Republican and partisan Supreme Court at this point. It didn't work out for him, but it doesn't change the fact. Like, how it plays out in terms of outcome doesn't change what Donald Trump's intention was when he was setting up the play. And that's something that I think has been largely lost in the media coverage. Yes, Sidney Powell and Rudy Giuliani have bungled terribly in their attempts to win this election in the courts. And, and, and I think we all knew it was ultimately doomed. And there are only so many people who are going to play along. That said, it is a troubling and bad thing that... Republicans in Congress have been indulging him. I was just reading a tweet storm by Rand Paul that was unhinged in many different ways. But while he was talking about the COVID and stimulus relief bill, another thing we're not talking about on the show today, uh, he then pivots and goes, and now I must say a few words about my friend. I would be remiss is the exact wording on this. I remember that. I would be remiss if I didn't say a few words about my dear friend donald trump okay sure thing rand uh it, well rand then goes on to talk about how the election has been dubious there are issues of voter fraud josh howley talking about that everyone in the presidential hopeful class is talking about that and this is bad uh, you know the, the, it is it is bad that donald trump lost but the Trump narrative about a stolen election is so strong that the Republicans must continue to kayfabe along with this idea that Trump was really screwed, <laughs> like that, that the American people really want Donald Trump and that he lost the election or that 
he was screwed out of the election. I mean, again, just to kind of reframe it, the Electoral College is rigged in favor of the Republicans, rigged in the sense of it advantages them in a structural way. It's it's a game where they get, at this point, a 7 million vote advantage. And so 7 million votes more for Joe Biden gets winnowed down to 70,000 more votes for Joe Biden, and they still lost. I, I, you know, you, it's not field day, as they might point out. Everyone does not get a participation prize. Uh, but the damage has been done. It's now going to be okay to challenge elections for this long. You've had Mitch McConnell saying that it doesn't matter until we get to the Electoral College. A whole bunch of norms, the bad ones, have been established in the Republicans. And they're not going to go away when Trump goes away. And I think that gets us into uh, me bringing up the curtain for the free siders here in a second. Um, when we're talking about the pardons here today, these are more of these bad norms. So with that, let me take a quick poof. I'm a poofer. My girlfriend makes fun of me when I call it the poofer. Don't make fun of me. I don't need to be made fun of. And I'm going to drink some cider. Mm. You know what? I'm going to put on some jams here. Well, uh, we, well, we, ooh. Yes, this is not jazz. This is horrible. All right, enough, enough, enough of this. <laughs> Thank you so much for supporting the Patreon side. Hopefully you enjoyed the tour of guitars. I, it is Christmas Eve. I, I, There's a lot that I could riff on, but I, I'll be honest. I, I think this pardons thing might go on a while here. So I, when I started writing this up, I was like, ooh, this rig could be fiery and long and you know, I, I got to go and do family stuff. So I want to get this up, edited, available for y'all today, uh, Christmas Eve today. Um, and then also, you know, so for people, if they want to listen to it on Christmas or whenever, uh, I had Daniel talk about, I listened to a lot of podcasts. And you know, so, hey, I appreciate that you make this podcast part of your listening. Um, it's way cool. Uh, so hopefully you enjoy the show uh, we got look at, look at all this stuff uh, i got i got some shit we gotta get through i got some shit we gotta get through so i am going to stop the share we'll bring it back to full screen and let us begin the show ladies and gentlemen hello again and welcome back to don't worry about the government my name is Chris Novembrino. It is Christmas Eve as I am taping this 2020. Hopefully, y'all are having a safe Christmas Eve. We now have a couple of vaccines that are out. I've been reading up about mRNA and the medical biotechnology behind mRNA and also CRISPR, and 
I think a lot of this stuff is promising despite the fact that we are, in my opinion, in what might be a, an era of pandemic. And like we might see more of this stuff. Obviously, there, there's a dark cloud on the horizon of this new strain of coronavirus, I believe, that is coming out of the United Kingdom. That's something to be wary about. So as science advances on one side here, there are going to be more diseases is the other part of this. And it will be that grand race of man's mind and will to live and man's mind and seeming need to destroy itself. In this case, by overpopulation and not necessarily taking care of the population in a way that can safely sustain that. Uh, so you got a lot of wealth on the planet, but if you don't use that wealth to make sure that people stay healthy, uh, you know, uh, diseases don't care if you are rich or poor. It, yes, obviously, rich people can get better treatment. But depending on the disease, it might not matter how much money you have, right? You know, if you get uh, Ebola, for example, all the money in the world probably won't save you because Ebola acts so quickly. Uh, that was the problem back in the 1990s. But we're getting a little bit sidetracked here. I'm riffing. I'm doing the solo show. When you're in flow, you got to just kind of roll with the changes, as the great band Ario Speedwagon said. Oh, my God. All right. Let's get into the show here. I have rhyming couplets to begin this show. That's where we're at. It's Christmas Eve. It's 2020. It's been a hard year. I've got rhyming couplets. Twas the night before Christmas. And in the White House, Trump was up to some bullshit. As always, that louse. I'm sorry. I'm trying to erase it. Uh, it might get edited out. Who knows? It might get left in because I want to just keep this thing flowing. So now Trump as he is winding down his administration, is still trying to fight this on some level in the courts. More importantly, though, he is bending the Republican kayfabe and mindset and narrative around this idea that the election was stolen. As Newsmax rises, as he continues to challenge this all the way up to the Electoral College rather than just concede, he opens up a normative structure for the Republicans where they can deny the results of an election all the way up until the Electoral College certifies the votes. Um, so, And you've now had this happen two times in two decades, once uh, in the year 2000 with the Bush election, and now again in 2020 with Trump challenging this election, despite having lost this election in a pretty clear way. Uh, Trump tried to challenge and get like all Pennsylvania's votes thrown out. He tried to get alternate slates of electors. He's been doing some really weird shit at the end of his administration. And to be clear, if you want to become a hashtag politics watcher, December is always a good time to be reading the headlines, particularly as we get to points like Christmas Eve and New Year's Eve as well, because that's when politicians like to duck in some of their nastiest shit, because generally, um, in years past when people could go out and it was safer, it, no one would be watching the news and the headlines, or not as many people would be watching the news and the headlines. You're not going to have a New Year's Eve riot. You know what I mean? Like, you could do some pretty fucked up shit on New Year's Eve and probably not have people storming the White House gates. In a way that, you know, maybe it would be harder to pull off. And I'm just picking a date at random here. March 17th, you know, or, or, or July 27th. Uh, those might actually be easier days than New Year's Eve or Christmas Eve. It's cold. People are home with their families. People have had a long year. They're enjoying some time off from work. They don't want to be outraged. Uh, but if you have been reading the headlines over the last eight weeks since the election, uh, I think there is plenty, eight, seven weeks, six weeks since the election. I don't, I don't know. Time moves so weird these days. Things have been weird, particularly in the last couple of weeks. So Bill Barr, it was announced, was being fired, uh, removed from office, and they announced that his exodus would be occurring on December 23rd. Uh, people, blue checks and smart people, said that there is nothing to this. Don't worry about it. There, This is just... Entirely coincidence and people like myself who were maybe confused why Bill Barr, who has been 
so helpful to Donald Trump all throughout his administration. And we will talk about, I'll, just a, I'll give you a quick sample of some of Bill Barr's helpfulness later on in this episode, but we'll revisit the Mueller report briefly and how Bill Barr's redactions made the Mueller report a less useful document than it actually is. Uh, it's just the media narrative moved on. Bill Barr was helpful. Bill Barr was covering for a lot of Donald Trump's sins, and lo, they are many. And something was starting to happen that was too much for even Bill Barr. We got whispers of it. Part of it was a special prosecutor to investigate Hunter Biden uh, so that we could keep the Hunter Biden investigation going on like Benghazi. And I'm not saying that Hunter Biden didn't do some messed up shit, probably. I, I mean, like, all the evidence is there. He went over to Ukraine. It was sort of like my dad totally owns this dealership. He's the vice president. You should put me on this board. He knows nothing about gas. Uh, it's kind of like I'm reminded a lot about Carter Page. A lot reminded to a certain extent about Don Jr. here. Hunter Biden is like a weird mixture of them, maybe a little bit more competent, maybe a little bit more addicted to drugs than Don Jr. or Carter Page. Page is weird, but I, Hunter Biden we know has issues uh let's just leave it at that um so i i, I get it uh but you know Barr didn't want to touch the special prosecution of hunter biden which kind of tells you where he's at even into getting dirt on hunter biden a thing which oh by the way don trump was impeached over uh i feel like it's worth mentioning anytime we bring up hunter biden that this was a thing that donald trump was explicitly impeached over trying to get dirt on but uh, we have moved on into weird things, things so weird that Bill Barr doesn't want to be a part of them. Uh, so what were they? Well, we found out over the last couple of days. Uh, it seems like part of it is this big string of pardons. And Donald Trump has done a bunch of messed up pardons. Now, before we get into this, I want to talk about some of the other m more innocuous and let's be real here. Uh, this is lighthearted because I think this will be reversed by the Biden administration like nothing. Donald Trump issued an executive order that said, I just got to read some of this. Uh, this cracks me up. It prohibits any new federal buildings from being built in a style anything other than neoclassical Georgian federal Greek revival bow arts or art deco styles uh, so this is specifically an anti-brutalist executive order and if you're like what is brutalism it is a style of architecture that was in part popular in the soviet union it's associated to some degree with communism and socialism in the 20th century it's also just a fucking style of building buildings so let's get into the executive order this is real this is from the office of the press secretary section one purpose societies have long recognized the importance of beautiful public architecture ancient greek and roman public buildings were designed to be sturdy and useful and also to beautify public spaces and inspire civic pride throughout the middle ages and the renaissance Public architecture continued to serve these purposes. The 1309 Constitution of the City of Siena required it. <laughs> My God. The 1309 Constitution of the City of Siena required that whoever rules the city must have the beauty of the city as his foremost preoccupation because it must provide pride, honor, wealth and growth to the Sienese citizens as well as pleasure and happiness to visitors from abroad lord knows <laughs> the one thing you associate with the conservative movement these days is welcoming and making happy visitors from abroad three centuries later the great british architect just to frame this again we're in the year 1609 now in this executive order from the year 2020 the great british architect sir christopher wren declared that quote public buildings are the ornament <laughs> are the ornament of a country architecture establishes a nation draws people and commerce 
and makes the people love their native country. Architecture aims at eternity. Notable founding fathers agreed with these assessments and attached great importance to federal civic architecture. They wanted America's public buildings to inspire the great American people and encourage civic virtue. President George Washington and Thomas Jefferson consciously modeled the most important buildings in Washington, D.C. on the classical architecture of Athens and Rome. <laughs> Quick aside here, thus inspiring conspiracy theories for hundreds of years. They sought to use classical architecture to visually connect our contemporary republic with the antecedents of democracy in classical antiquity, reminding citizens not only of their rights, but also their responsibilities in maintaining and per perpetrating, or no, perpetuating these institutions. That, that, that last line almost reads like a fucking troll at this point. Uh, and it goes on with this. Um, it, we, it goes on for a very long time here. Uh, I'm trying to see if we eventually get into uh, modernism. We do. We do. Uh, yes. So the other part of this beyond brutalism is also modernism. Yeah. This is some of what the Trump administration is, is spending time on. Uh, I, it, it, this goes on for several pages, uh, but you get the idea. I think we, we've covered it here. We started in the year 1309, promoting beautiful federal civic architecture. Anyways, that's some of what the Trump administration has been doing, and Frankly, one of the good things about the Biden administration coming in is that shit like that is not going to come to pass because I mean, it, it's stupid. But like if Trump had remained president, then all builders, uh, federally speaking, would have to make structures in that style. And who knows how that style might interfere with different engineering techniques, more modern engineering techniques. Uh, it's literally confining builders to dated, uh, historical, but also dated building techniques when there are more efficient techniques that should and can be used uh, that could be better for energy, for example. Um, it's not really about aesthetics. Also, really weird to just be mindlessly concerned about aesthetics on that front, regardless of the cost, especially the same party that wants to cut the arts for any other thing. Uh, anyways, very Trumpy thing, very weird, like arch kind of crypto. They're taking our culture conservative thing, like a Steve Miller, very online uh, white nationalist, uh, yeah, white genocide type thing. Uh, they're taking our architecture, they're taking our history away from us, that sort of thing. Um, will be reversed by the Biden administration, but. One, slightly creepy. Two, slightly funny. Let's let's keep it real. Not funny. Donald Trump has been issuing pardons throughout his administration, and they have been of a dubious moral value in a continual way, often being done as virtue signals to tell people throughout the course of the Mueller probe, hey, if you hang tight, I will pardon you. At the time, people like myself would bring up a number of pardons, and we'll recap some of those. And we would say, hey, Donald Trump is using this as a way to signal to people involved in the Russia investigation that if you do not play ball with the investigation, and even more importantly, if you lie on behalf of Donald Trump, whatever trouble you get into with the federal government, Donald Trump will use his power of the pardon that is covered and allowed for in the Constitution, I think is a valuable check on the judiciary. And in this sense, I would not want to get rid of it from the president. However, that being said, the whole point of the pardon is it's supposed to be used for clemency for wrongful convictions, uh, wrongful death penalties, uh, drug offenders, uh, you know, that sort of thing. If you thought that a law was effectively an immoral law, you could do a blanket federal pardon and nullify that law. And this allows the president to serve on serve as a check on both the congressional and the judicial branch simultaneously using this pardon power, but it's meant to be done 
pardon the pun here, judiciously. It's meant to be done with, with like a real reservation. Uh, it's meant to be used in a way that would largely be indisputable, it, mostly to move a process along that people were aware was immoral. So like, let's say you were the incoming president, Joe Biden, and you wanted to do something like, that was very popular with the American people, like legalize marijuana or effectively decriminalize it across the country. An important thing to move the process along on a state level would be to issue pardons for all marijuana convictions at the federal level to prompt a similar action down at the state level. In this sense, the presidential pardon is a valuable and useful tool when done in a moral way. Donald Trump, however, has been using his pardon as a way of flouting the law and skirting the law. And it seems fairly clear that the reason that William Barr wanted to be out of the administration as the attorney generals, one, he didn't want to be involved in things like a special prosecutor to look into election fraud and to look into Hunter Biden, and he didn't want to be tasked with naming those special prosecutors. Oh, by the way, they could still be named in the next 20, 25 days here. Trump's still president until January 20th. It is December 24th as we are taping this. It is very possible. Trump names a special prosecutor. Trump names a new AG, and that new AG names a special prosecutor in 20 days. Entirely possible. Um, there's a long history. As we talked about with who's your attorney general, if you remember that episode, there's a long history of transitional attorney generals. Remember, Eric Holder was initially a transitional attorney general. And you can do things as a transitional AG. You have all the same powers just for a transitional period of time. So... There's clearly stuff that Barr wouldn't do that Trump wants done, and we're starting to see a decent amount of that. One of the funniest things throughout the Russia probe, uh, in terms of talking points, whether it was the Trump uh, and the Trump loyalist people or the Russo skeptic left, the, your Glenn Greenwalds and Aaron Mates of the world, um, they'd be like, where's the quid pro quo um they, they would say this and be very convinced of themselves even though there'd be evidence whether it involved the miss america pageant people buying apartments in 666 fifth avenue or in other trump real estate properties uh that one floor that was entirely bought out by people from russia total coincidence i'm sure <laughs> um like you know there's always been quid pro quos all over the place if you want to see them but i think a better way of thinking about this uh, a better way of kind of throwing the ball back in their court is this what relationship has donald trump had throughout his I would say his life, but maybe you could go back like, you know, he's got some friends in celebrity culture or whatever. But but even then, what relationship has Donald Trump had that you can think of that has not been transactional, that has not involved a quid pro quo? And you could say, oh, everybody gets something out of a friendship. Yeah, but in a lot of cases, it's like a reciprocal thing that like is often ethereal. You just enjoy each other's company. Um, human beings like social contact. Uh, that's not really quid pro quo. I'm talking about Trump, every relationship he has, right down to the celebrity relationships. It's all about he trades, you know, his name for fame what, with his relationship with Vince McMahon. Why does he do the appearances on WWE television? Because he can get WrestleMania to appear on Trump properties. That, that's the relationship there. They also are kind of simpatico, but like Vince McMahon, Donald Trump, not super best friends. Um, strong personalities that would clash if they were hanging out together all the time. But the thing that brings both these dudes to the table is a transaction. And Trump has been like that in his relationship with everyone from Michael Cohen. Um, the only people who are maybe not like that would be members of his family. But, you know. His relationship with Don Jr., I think part of his frustration is that he's not getting a very good transaction out of his relationship with Don Jr. And without getting gross, uh, I, I think maybe there is not like not like that, but like his relationship with Ivanka, like he gets something 
out of it that it's not not like that but you know he's he has made all those weird ass comments about being aroused by his daughter so like i think it pleases him to take care of his daughter and again not like that i've never seen any evidence to that effect but um but he's getting something out of that could explain the relationship with Kushner and taking care of Kushner. Why does he take care of Kushner's father-in-law? A transaction. There isn't anyone really in Trump's orbit who he hasn't been trying to get a transaction out of. Uh, right down to his relationship with Rudy Giuliani. Giuliani, uh, he takes care of him because there's a transaction being done by this. Stormy Daniels, a transaction. Uh, a, 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 an illegal usage of campaign funds transaction no less so it makes sense that the pardons would be more of trump's transactionalism and we've been seeing signals of this all the way along um you have early loyalists getting cover people like dinesh d'souza conservative commentator who pled guilty to making illegal campaign contributions to the 2012 senate campaign of his republican friend wendy long part of that was as a way of signaling i don't even view this stormy daniel stuff as being credible he was using it a little bit as a virtue signal on that but also dinesh d'souza have been a strong and vocal partisan on behalf of trump trump is sending a message that if you are loyal to me i will take care of you same idea with lewis scooter libby who was convicted of perjury on two counts and obstruction of justice Sound familiar? And also false statements. He's previously the aide to Dick Cheney, and he was convicted in connection to the CIA leak scandal, um, pardoned on an earlier commutation by George W. Bush in July 2007. So he'd already had the sentence commuted. So Scooter Libby was okay in terms of facing any legal penalty for this because of what George W. Bush did. Trump went one step further and said, no, no, no. If you commit perjury, obstruction of justice, and make false statements to the FBI or CIA, I will pardon you and I will cover you because I don't view that as morally being wrong. Message? I think so. Uh, that's why he did it. And he did that right in the middle of the Mueller probe. Then we get into Joe Arpaio. Remember Joe Arpaio, a former sheriff of Maricopa County, Arizona, when I was living in Maricopa County, Arizona. I remember the pink underwear and everything with Joe Arpaio. He was an anti-immigration illegal uh, immigration hardliner. He made the inmates wear the pink underwear, not that Joe Arpaio was wearing the pink underwear. That'd be kind of funny. No, no, no. He made people who are supposed to have dignity wear pink underwear as a way of uh, embarrassing them and making them feel less than. Uh, he's a cool dude. He was convicted of contempt of court and was awaiting sentencing. Arpaio was also a big booster of Donald Trump uh, all throughout. He was pardoned for one contempt offense for which he had been convicted but not yet sentenced. And for any not yet charged offenses that he may have committed in the same case. That is the most interesting wrinkle in the Arpaio pardons. Is that... Trump was already starting to reach out his fingers to future crime and using the pardon power as a way of pardoning future crime. Will we see some of that in the next 25 days? I tend to think based on the news over the last two days, yes. Uh, and, and I certainly think you can look at these, these pardons as and commutations in the case of this next one as telegraphs of what was to come. In issuing the pardon, the White House cited Arpaio's, quote, more than 50 years of admirable service to the United States. Rod Blagojevich had his sentence commuted. He was the former governor of Illinois. And when Don't Worry About the Government started years ago, kind of the poster boy of corruption on this show. It was someone that... Democrat or Republican, everyone in the country agreed this guy was corrupt as fuck and should not be allowed anywhere near the levers of power, should be serving time, not a good guy. He's the former governor of Illinois, the contestant 
on Trump's reality television show, The Celebrity Apprentice, and he was convicted of attempting to sell the Senate seat that was vacated by Barack Obama, plus extortion by withholding state funds being directed towards a children's hospital and a racetrack. There was actually tape of him saying on the phone, I've got this thing and it's fucking golden and I'm not going to give it away for nothing. Recorded, recorded. It is not a question if, if you want to understand reality, if you want to get into the Karl Popper, how do we know anything? It's not a question of whether or not we know Rod Blagojevich was trying to sell the Senate seat. You would have to basically be brain dead to think anything other than that. Um, the Illinois House impeached him for abuse of power. The democratically held Illinois House impeached him for abuse of power and corruption. In two separate and unanimous votes in the Illinois Senate, he was removed from office and prohibited from ever holding public office in the state of Illinois again. Donald Trump commuted that sentence. Message here. A message here. Part of the issue, though, over the last couple of years has been a false balance in the media that's been obfuscating what's been going on. I'll just give you an example rather than getting lost in the endless weeds of copy from 2018. Here is some copy from the Associated Press from February 2018 when Blagojevich was pardoned. Those who got a break from Trump include financier Michael Milton, the junk bond king who served two years in prison in the 1990s after pleading guilty to violating U.S. security law. He's also the guy the Gordon Gecko was based off of uh, in the movie Greed. Greed is good. Yeah, that guy. Um, he was very guilty, and he ended up paying back fines that were like in the totals of hundreds of millions of dollars in the year 1990. Like he really bilked a lot of investors. Uh, he also pardoned or commuted the sentence of Edward. D. Bartolo, the former San Francisco 49ers owner convicted in gambling fraud scandal after building one of the most successful NFL teams in history. But, and this is the example of bad copywriting from the AP, Trump also commuted the sentences of several women with more sympathetic cases to balance out the men convicted of corruption. There's no better example of false balance on a, a number of different levels then saying, yes, Trump was pardoning a bunch of very guilty men, but he also pardoned some innocent women. It's like sexism, but it's also false balance. A lot of stuff going on in that AP copy. Uh, and that's been the problem. It's sort of emblematic of a problem in the media and the media coverage of everything that's been happening in the last six weeks, but everything that's been happening over the last four years. These things are all of a piece. They all connect. One event telegraphs what comes next because as your parents told you, actions speak louder than words. You can look at these actions and Trump and the media can go, oh, he, you know, he wouldn't. He would never. Oh, he wouldn't do that. Oh, no, no, no. But if he does these things, that means something. He's telling you, he's telling you in a nonverbal way, Oh, yeah, I would do these things. That's why he did these things. So what came down here over the last couple of days? It has been a rogues gallery. And perhaps, just perhaps, we might be able to get a sense of Trump's sense of morality, what this administration has all been about. Maybe, uh, was there anything to that Russia investigation after all? Oh, maybe just, maybe... Uh, there, there was? Uh, we'll, we'll see all these things in just a second here. But first, we start with Congressman Duncan Hunter of California. Uh, and I'll mention here the copy is a mixture of Reuters copy, Washington Post, New York Times, and a sprinkle of reportage that I gleaned from Twitter here over the last few days. Uh, so I'm going to be pinging and ponging from all this copy not going to be citing each time I ping and pong. Just want to let you know it, it, that that's where I got all this from. 
Duncan Hunter, who prosecutors allege used hundreds of thousands of dollars in campaign funds to pay for family vacation and theater tickets and even facilitate extramarital affairs, had been facing 11 months of a federal prison sentence. He pleaded guilty in 2019 to misusing campaign funds and won election while under federal indictment, only to later admit wrongdoings and resign. It's worth noting that while Hunter got a pardon, Duncan Hunter, his wife, she was also convicted and got eight months of home confinement, but did not get a pardon from the Trump administration. Sort of a double whammy here. I'll also mention that the mainstream press reporting didn't capture that factoid. I had to get that one from uh, online. So, yeah, way cool. Next, we have Congressman Chris Collins from New York. Chris Collins had been serving a 26-month sentence for insider trading scheme and lying to the FBI. He, too, had pleaded guilty in that case. Collins and Hunter were among Trump's first congressional supporters. And, and a running trend here, too, throughout some of Trump's earlier pardons is trying to undo any and all of Comey's convictions throughout the entirety of his career. Uh, it's not like some deeply held, highfalutin, uh, don't know that I've run into a whole lot of them, uh, premises of, James Comey is this really awful guy who is really bad at being a prosecutor or really bad at being like the head of the FBI. No, Trump is just trying to enact vendettas. Um, he used the pardon power as a way of sort of slapping people in the face. And in this case, he used it as a way of rewarding Duncan Hunter and Chris Collins. Another beneficiary of Trump's pardon power and the abuse thereof is Steve Stockman from Texas. Stockman was about two years into a 10-year sentence, having been convicted in 2018 of conspiring to take hundreds of thousands of dollars in donations that were meant for charity and voter education. Among those who had signed a petition seeking mercy for Stockman was Sidney Powell, who has been pushing Trump's false allegations that his election loss came as a result of voter fraud. Yeah. So we're also seeing Powell, and she's got a real presence in the White House in these closing days. I, I know the White House did that official distancing from Sidney Powell, but that was officially unofficial sort of shit. Uh, they, she is still very much having sway, as evidenced here by Steve Stockman. Then we get to family members, and what I think is perhaps a presage of what is to come for other members of Trump's family Charles Kushner, he pled guilty in 2004 to 16 counts of tax evasion, a single count of retaliating against a federal witness, and one of lying to the Federal Elections Commission. Uh, so this would kind of covers a number of Trump's bases here, right? Uh, the crimes that are cool that Trump would reward you for, up to and including lying to the Federal Elections Commission. Kushner had served two years in prison before being released in 2006. So he had served time. He had been released. But the prison sentence was a searing event for the Kushner family. It's one of the things that kept Chris Christie from rising higher in the Trump orbit. Christie has been very vocal about his disdain for Charles Kushner. I think that is heartfelt. I think he does look at Charles Kushner as, as a pretty vile guy, and I don't think it's just from bad interactions with Donald Trump. And the witness that Kushner was accused of retaliating against was his brother-in-law, whose wife, Mrs. Kushner's, or Mr. Kushner's sister, was cooperating with federal officials in a campaign finance investigation into Mr. Kushner. It's kind of covering that campaign finance side, too, of uh, Trump's life. Kushner was accused of videotaping his brother-in-law with a prostitute and then sending it to his sister. So, uh, I mean, any number of different kind of skeezy things being done there to pressure members of his own family. Yeah. George Papadopoulos. Remember George Papadopoulos? At one point, him and his strange curious definitely 100 totally italian for sure 
uh, girlfriend, Simona Mangianti. Uh, I don't know that I necessarily believe that sentence that just came out of my mouth. George Papadopoulos, uh, a former Trump campaign aide who pled guilty as part of the investigation to Russian meddling and once said that he was going to be the John Dean of the Russia probe. Uh, he did plead guilty to some small time stuff, but he ended up getting a pardon. Why? Because he ended up playing ball and not giving federal investigators what they need, what they needed, which is why they ended up charging him on some stuff. Alex Vanderswan, kind of a lesser known name on this, he was also tied into the Mueller probe. He got a pardon too, and it's worth noting as I'm rattling off all these pardons that the Trump administration has been extremely stingy on using these pardons. Uh, it, one of the stingiest administrations when it comes to the usage of the pardon power since James A. Garfield, since James A. Garfield in the 1800s, 1880, Garfield was assassinated. Um, this is not an administration that uses it for fixing unjust laws. These names that I'm rattling off are a non-negligible percentage of the people that Donald Trump has pardoned during the course of his administration. Yes, he pardoned Jack Johnson. Yes, he pardoned Susan B. Anthony. Yes, he pardoned some other people that Kim Kardashian won pardoned. And he's also, yes, pardoned some drug offenders and that sort of thing. But these people here, this is a decent chunk of who Donald Trump has pardoned. Uh, it's a non-negligible portion. Mike Flynn. Mike Flynn got pardoned. And I, I mean, we could do an entire recap of Mike Flynn. It, if you find the Russia connections to be uncompelling. I mean, the dude was literally sitting at a table with Jill Stein and Vladimir Putin in 2015. And then is helping Donald Trump get elected to be president is brought in as the foreign policy advisor and then is found to have problematic ties and has since left. He's hanging out with Alex Jones now. I, I mean, the idea that there's ever been a real question about M Mike Flynn's character or anything like that. I talked to conservative friends who I love. I love some of you. Um, but Mike Flynn's a bad dude. He's a bad fucking dude. And if you find the Russia stuff uncompelling, look into the Turkey stuff. Look into SEL group. Look into what Recep Tayyip Erdogan has been trying to do. Trying to extract Fatula Gulen and, and bring him to a CIA black site. And, oh, by the way, in this last month, trying to advise Donald Trump to use martial law um, and deploy the military to rerun the election. A thing that Donald Trump asked about a briefing here and oh by the way Flynn's still appearing at briefings at the tail end of this administration so he's there as Trump was transitioning in he's there yet again as Trump's transitioning out and he got a pardon um that was back in November um but you start putting these names together you start making a pretty clear little narrative next we get into Polly Polly Manafort Polly Manafort have been sentenced to seven and a half years in prison, which was a modest sentence. And at the time, I wanted him to get the book thrown on him because I figured this was going to go this way anyways. And it was more important that Pauly had a big sentence and that that was permanently on the record. And, oh, by the way, like if he had died in prison, probably should. He's a bad, bad, bad guy. Again, I'm not going to recap all the people he's ever worked for. And it's not really about Trump. You can look at his career prior to Trump. Paul Manafort's done nothing good throughout the entirety of his career. And his relationship with Donald Trump and Roger Stone goes all the way back to the 1980s. And they weren't up to anything good back then either. Paul Manafort was facing seven and a half years in prison for his role in a decade-long multi-million dollar financial fraud scheme for his work in the former Soviet Union. That's what he was in jail for. It wasn't even the stuff he helped Trump out for. He was released from prison early in May because of COVID-19 and given home confinement. 
Trump had repeatedly expressed sympathy for Manafort throughout the process, including his court case, describing him as a brave man who had been mistreated by the special counsel's office. Uh, More importantly, though, in the Mueller report, Barr did Donald Trump a lot of favors by redacting extended chunks. So I'm going to read a little bit of the Mueller report here. Discussion of pardons. The possibility of pardons came up a couple of months after Gates' indictment. There were stories about the FBI and DOJ being corrupt, and Manafort said that he was having conversations with John Dowd, as was Manafort's lawyer. Now, this was stuff that William Barr redacted on behalf of Donald Trump and did Donald Trump a big favor. Let me read a little bit of this. This is uh, a harm to ongoing matters redaction. In October or November of 2017, Gates and Manafort had a conversation in which Manafort indicated that they would, quote, get through it and that the charges were trumped up and, quote, BS and that they would figure out and or that they would figure it out and that there was more to come. Gates had the sense that Manafort was saying to Gates not to plead. Manafort told Gates that the Nunez report, remember the Nunez report? It would come out soon and that there would be bombshells in it. Okay, that didn't work out. Uh, The Nunez report, as we covered at the time, actually was a self-rebutting document. Yes, they got away with some of this shit. It doesn't make them fucking geniuses either. Some Some of the stuff, clearly they're idiots. Manafort said that he talked to Dowd and that they had talked about starting a legal defense fund, like a GoFundMe for for these guys. Manafort did not say whether Dowd brought up Nunes. In January of 2018, CNN leaked that a plea agreement had been reached, and Manafort told Gates people were worried that it was true. Gates called Manafort and told him it was not true. Manafort told Gates that he, Manafort, had called Dowd and also told Dowd it was not true and that Gates had reached a plea agreement. Manafort said something like, quote, I talked to Dowd, I've covered you at the White House, and added that a legal defense fund was coming and that they were going to, quote, take care of us. Manafort told Gates that there were two funds out there. The first was called Patriot Defense Funds, and it covered White House staff, and the other fund would cover anyone outside of the White House, and Manafort and Gates would be number one and number two on that list. That's a quote. Manafort told Gates that it was stupid to plead and that he would get a better deal down the road. Manafort said that he had been in touch with Dowd and repeatedly he Dowd had said that they should, quote, sit tight and that, quote, we'll all be taken care of. Manafort never explicitly mentioned pardons. Gates asked Manafort outright if anyone mentioned pardons and Manafort said no one had used that word. Manafort, fairly cagey, might have been onto the idea. I mean, the guy had been an operator in the Soviet Union for a very long time, and he knows w- what he was dealing with in Rick Gates, too, who had also been an operator over there, and there was a lot of pressure on all these guys. Everyone's got their defenses up. But, man, you see a lot of things going on there in this section. Uh, obviously, you see what Barr covered for. I talk a lot about the Rittenhouse precedent and the idea of setting up legal GoFundMe for really bad people to essentially allow them to skirt the law, right? Like you you have so much money that you don't have to pay the parking ticket or the parking ticket doesn't mean anything to you. So celebrities just get the ticket and then they just pay the fine because they're so rich, it doesn't matter. Um, GoFundMe is essentially in these legal defense funds allow people to break the law. And if you've got enough money, you can kind of lawyer your way out of it or lawyer your way down to a really good deal. And if you've got enough stroke at the political level, you can get the governor to pardon you at the state level or you can get the president to pardon you on the federal level. You really set up this culture where if you're rich enough, you can get away with it. And it's just us poor schlubs who are so poor that we're subject to the laws, Um, essentially laws for the poor. And if you've got enough money, well, then you just pay a tax and you don't really have to pay. You don't have to do the time. Um, the, the report goes on here. I want to read a little bit more um, because I think this is important in the sense of if we had had this when we were looking at the Mueller report, and the Mueller report was pretty bad anyways, despite all the redactions. 
But this document becomes that much more damning. Uh, does it result in Trump getting impeached and removed from office? I'm sure some of you are kind of muttering that at the radio right now. No, no, it doesn't. No, it doesn't. Uh, because we have weak Democrats and really corrupt Republicans. And we have an apathetic public and, 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 and. But it's still important to know what the fuck really happened. And that's why it was important to get these documents. That's why it was good that Jason Leopold, and I think it was CNN who uh, joined in on those lawsuits, kept putting in all those FOIA requests. And that's why we have this stuff. And hopefully more pressure will be put on the Biden administration and we'll get more of this shit out too so that we can know what happened so that we can at least understand the fuckery that was going on over the last couple of years. Going back to the Mueller report. In February 2018, the day before Gates entered his plea, Manafort called Gates, and his tone was that Gates should stick to his guns and we'll get through this. Manafort told Gates that he'd been on the phone with Dowd and Dowd and and that his Dowd had been there when Trump walked into the room with Dowd and said to Manafort something to the effects of stay strong. Manafort told Gates that Kushner had sent him emails of support and they could show the emails to Gates if they were together. That that's kind of an interesting way of doing. It. Like he didn't want to send the paper trail over to Gates. Obviously, Manafort's got his intent. Right? Gates had the sense that the emails Manafort mentioned were recent. Gates had no basis to trust Manafort and thought the conversation was designed to convince Gates to not plead guilty. By then, Gates had already made his decision. Gates added that Manafort talked a big game, but Gates had no confidence what he said was true. Gates thought, and this is still redacted, um, and, and it's interesting. Listen to the telephone call between Manafort and Gates. Gates did not tell Manafort others listened to the call. I think that that redaction there that's still present is that Donald Trump was listening to that call. And uh, that's speculative from Gates. Maybe that's why they still don't want to include it. But, I mean, it makes sense, right? Like, why would Trump say stay strong and apparently walk into the room? Here that... Manafort was on the phone with Gates or like Dowd was on the Gates of Manafort and, and, you know, trying to get a sense of what's going on there. And, and Trump, Trump, no, this is Donald Trump we're talking about. We'll go like, well, guess I'm not interested in that. I'm going to go back to doing something really responsible for the poor of America. No, fuck yeah, he's staying in the room. Uh, I think that's what's going on with that redaction there. The day of Gates' plea... Manafort called again and went through a last-minute appeal, the Gates not plea. Manafort mentioned the legal defense fund in that call as well. That was the last time Gates spoke to Manafort, but they have communicated by text. Manafort sent Gates a text message congratulating him for getting rid of his GPS monitor at some point. (laughs) Ha! That's some fucking troll shit right there from Manafort. In one of the calls with Manafort, Manafort told Gates that Trump was watching their case. And Gates also noted that the media asked Trump about Gates at one point and Trump had no response. Gates thought that was surprising and that Trump would have gone after him. Gates was not sure the source of the reporting on the plea agreements. Gates told Gates had told Blank about it. Manafort did not know. Gates not no indication from Manafort that Manafort knew that Gates planned to plead when he did. A lot of P's there. Gates knew Blank had a friend at CNN, but Blank did not have enough detail to be the source. So this is kind of interesting, too, because it gets back to internal leaks. Uh, anyways, a little bit of what was redacted by Barr in doing cover for Donald Trump throughout this. And just a little bit of like how present the pardon was throughout the Mueller probe process. Also, the fact that Manafort was helping facilitate the use of pardons as as a bribing tool gets us back to the Rod Blagojevich precedent. Connecting these dots, showing that they're all of a piece, man. That like it, it's impossible to understand this sequence as being not from the same tree of logic that the pardons for people like Dinesh D'Souza and Rod Blagojevich and Charles Kushner and um, Louis Scooter Libby, Joe Arpaio, uh, like that's what we were doing here. Joe Arpaio was the big one. Joe Arpaio was a big telegraphing pardon. Uh, It sent a big message there. 
other people who benefited from these pardons. Uh, not Rick Gates. Manafort did. But Roger Stone. Roger Stone, a longtime friend and advisor to Donald Trump, was sentenced in February 2020 to more than three years in prison in a politically fraught case that put the president at odds with his attorney general, uh, I guess. Stone was convicted of seven felony charges, including lying under oath to a congressional committee and threatening a witness whose testimony would have exposed those lies. That's Randy Credico. He threatened to kill the guy's dog. Trump commuted Roger Stone's sentence in July and then pardoned him in December. So not just a commutation, but also a pardon. Now he said that Stone had been treated very unfairly and then said that pardoning him would help right the injustices that he faced at the hands of the Mueller investigation. Now, Barr also did uh, some favors for Donald Trump when it came to Roger Stone. Most importantly, and I think th this has been handy for other people too, uh, involving Stone's relationship with WikiLeaks and in specific Julian Assange. Uh, because we'll talk about Assange in just a minute here. I, I don't, if Assange gets pardoned, I, it will be for all the wrong reasons, though it'll be cited as being for the right reasons. Um, so we'll read from the Mueller report involving Roger Stone a little bit here, and we'll get into some of the things that have been recently unredacted. We also examined the evidence of the president's intent in making public statements about Manafort at the beginning of his trial when the jury was deliberating. Uh, remember, Trump made statements in favor of Manafort saying he was getting screwed, essentially trying to tamper with the jury. The trial generated widespread publicity. And as the jury began to deliberate, commentators suggested that an acquittal would add pressure to end the special counsel's investigation. By publicly stating on the second day of deliberation that Manafort happens to be, quote, happens to be a very good person. And that, quote, it's very sad what they've done to Paul Manafort right after calling the special counsel's investigation, quote, a rigged witch hunt. The president's statements could, if they had reached jurors, have the natural tendency to engender sympathy for Manafort among jurors. And a fact finder could infer that the president intended that result. But there are alternative explanations for the president's comments, including that he felt genuinely sorry for Manafort or that his goal was not to influence the jury, but to influence public opinion. The, a far more credible alternative theory than the first one that Mueller posited there. The president's comments also could have been intended to continue sending a message to Manafort that a pardon was possible. Also a plausible theory. And like these are tensions that I think Mueller is agonizingly judicious on as described above the president made his comments about manafort quote being a very good person immediately after declining to answer a question about whether he would pardon paul manafort so that was interesting and that was available to the public at the time it does i this is the thing with Mueller is you know he was hedging and going here's what i know factually I, you can interpret those facts in a number of different ways uh i think i think with Mueller, his issue is that he was not necessarily doing what i would do which is that broader contextual analysis it's a little more fraught i would admit that but you know, we can look at things that were done in 2018 and put them in the context of things that are done in 2019 and things that were done in 2019 and put them in the context of things that were done in 2020. And I think in, in to an agonizing way, uh, this often did not happen. Now, what was unredacted here recently is this. With regards to president's conduct towards Roger Stone, there's evidence that now Trump sought to enforce Stone's public statements that he would not cooperate with the government when the president likely understood that Stone could potentially provide evidence that would be adverse to the president. By late 2018, Trump had provided written answers to the special counsel's office in which the president said he did not recall, quote, the specifics of any call he had with Stone during the campaign period and did not recall discussing WikiLeaks with Stone. Witnesses have stated, however, that Trump discussed WikiLeaks with Stone and that Trump knew that Manafort and Gates had asked Stone to find out what other damaging information about Clinton WikiLeaks possessed and that Stone claimed connection to WikiLeaks and that that was a common knowledge within the campaign. 
it is possible that by the time the president submitted his written answers two years after the relevant events had occurred, he had no clear recollection of his discussion with Stones or his knowledge of Stone and his communications with WikiLeaks. But the president's conduct could also be viewed as reflecting an awareness that Stone could provide evidence that would run counter to the president's denials and would link the president to Stone's efforts to reach out to WikiLeaks. In November 28, 2018, eight days after the president submitted his written answers to the special counsel, the president criticized, quote, flipping and said that, remember that, flipping, and said that Stone was very brave for not cooperating with prosecutors. Five days later, on December 3, 2018, so almost two years uh, to the day here, the president applauded Stone for having, quote, guts not testify, while not testifying against him. Those statements, as well as complimenting Stone and Manafort while disparaging Michael Cohen, once Cohen chose to cooperate, support the inference that the president intended to communicate a message that witnesses could be rewarded for refusing to provide testimony adverse to the president and disparaged if they chose to cooperate. So Trump would also dog drag your name as well as not pardon you. So carrots and sticks. Trump pardon the whole James gang, uh, which is a thing you do if there's nothing to the Mueller investigation. And it's totally basis and it's just Russiagate, right? Um, there were a lot of bogus pardons surrounding the Benghazi investigation. You, you remember that clearly, right? Uh, there, there were a lot of bogus pardons around the Awan investigation at the end of 2016, right? You, you don't remember that, right? A lot, of, a lot of bogus pardons around the Clinton Foundation, right? There have been so many scandals throughout the years. Um, and like at one point, Bill Clinton pardoned Mark Elias, and that was like a three month like news bubble scandal thing back in the day. So like the point being, you only tend to do these sorts of kind of high profile, controversial guys guilty of shit pardons when they're guilty. When they did it, uh, and, and you look at the James gang being pardoned here, and yeah, Trump's corruption runs deep and it's far and wide. The guy's an immoral dude, and when you put an immoral person in the White House to quote unquote shake things up, or you, you know you embrace the accelerationism kind of narrative. To, to shake things up, uh, maybe challenge the military industrial complex, challenge the war power state. He's got the isolationist mindset, as a Glenn Greenwald might say. Um, you're also bringing in someone in Donald Trump who is an absolute moral vacuum. And then to bring us back around to the isolationist mindset, uh, Trump sort of finished this off it was, as though it was not bad enough to pardon the James gang. Trump finished this off by pardoning fucking war criminals, Iraq war criminals. Um, I've heard a lot over the last several years about Obama and his usage of drone warfare, a thing we talked about on the show at the time. I was not a fan of it, very strongly against it, uh, to the annoyance of Joe Gigi, who I think was a little bit more tolerant of it than uh, I think he should have been at the time. I, I was honest with him then, and I still feel that way. But... Uh, Trump has accelerated the usage of drone warfare. Trump dropped the mother of all bombs, um, the, the, the Moab, as it was called. And now Trump, to finish out his administration, pardoned some of the only war criminals convicted in the Iraq war. Uh, the U.S. was very, very poorly behaved in the invasion of Iraq, right? Uh, poorly behaved is a glib, glib, glib understatement. We committed fucking war crimes in Tahrir Square and Nisor Square. I, I mean, there are massacres, a number of different massacres. Nicholas Slayton, Paul Slow, Evan Liberty, and Dustin Hurd were security contractors in the former security firm Blackwater. Um, Eric Prince was part of the Trump administration. Betsy DeVos is his sister, also part of the Trump administration. They were convicted for their roles in the 2007 massacre of 14 unarmed Iraqi civilians at a Baghdad traffic stop. The 
September 2007 shooting in which Blackwater contractors left 14 dead and 17 wounded set off a diplomatic crisis on oversight in American security contractors during one of the deadliest periods in the Iraq war. Slatton had been sentenced to life in prison. Slough and Liberty to 15 and 14 years and Heard to 12 years and seven months. Slatton, a former security guard for Blackwater USA, was sentenced to life in prison without parole for committing first degree murder for killing Ahmed Haytham Ahmed Al Rubiai. I hope I got that name right because, uh, fuck man, fuck man. Um, and who's he was one of the 14 unarmed civilians killed by these military contractors over there. Uh, so Trump let that guy off. It's the Rittenhouse precedent. Uh, it, it's the, we're, we got your back. If you're an insider, we're going to cover you. All these things are of a piece. And uh, most importantly, uh, the, the people who thought, oh, well, Trump's going to really help the military industrial complex. No, Trump's sort of final act in office here is saying war crimes are cool when we, the United States government, do them. And the Bush administration was way too cavalier with committing war crimes, uh, an understatement to say the least. At least this one had been held to account somewhat decently after so many countless others have been allowed to slide on by. Um, at least this one had been held to account. I mean, it's part of what made WikiLeaks relevant back in the day is the collateral murder video showed that the United States was doing horrible shit. Uh, we were killing reporters and we were getting away with it. And it's not okay. We were committing war crimes and it's not acceptable. And we, the United States government needs to be held to account when the United States government commits war crimes, just like the Chinese government or the Russian government, any government. That's the whole point of the post-World War II norms that uh, the world tried to establish to avoid a rise of fascism on the planet and fascist powers doing expansionist and imperialist things. Um, that's part of what all the war crimes stuff uh, it serves as a, a check. It's an anti-fascist check. Uh, and Trump's last act is sort of go fascism. Cool. Like, especially like American fascism, but he, th this is always Trump's form of isolationism, right? It wasn't like isolationism, like let's all live in peace. It's like, Hey, don't pay attention to me when I do this fascist thing over there. Don't pay attention to me when we do this imperialist thing over there. Uh, if we commit some war crimes over there, don't pay attention. You don't have standing. You mind your business. We, we, we don't bother you when you do your weird thing. Uh, yeah, that's what Trump's doing here. And Trump's also saying, ban Muslims, kill Muslims, got you on either side coming and going. Um, and if we can cover you, we can cover you, Kyle Rittenhouse, Nicholas Slayton, because because you kill the right people. We might be able to get you out. We may be able to cover you. So those are Trump's pardons right now, as I'm taping, and we're finishing up at six ten a.m. on Christmas Eve. There are a couple more names on the list, though, that have been floated out there. And first and foremost, we got to talk about Julian Assange. Julian Assange. All right, like, look, if, if you're talking about collateral murder or you're talking about even the NSA leaks, which might have been facilitated by Russia, but the, the collateral murder video, he could have gotten that from any number of different sources. Uh, it doesn't necessarily have to be Russian propaganda. I've never seen any evidence to suggest that it was. Um, the early run of WikiLeaks, 2008-2010 uh, WikiLeaks, a good and valuable organization providing a real insight into the U.S.'s conduct in the Iraq war. The Iraq war logs, useful, um, allowed for a syncing up of past events. So you're not as like betraying current troop positions. You're talking about past actions. It might hurt. I mean, it it can. I, I, anyone who says, oh, well, you know, you don't know. Or, or like, well, how can that possibly be? It, I mean, anyone could use past information and connect dots about future predictive behavior. So it, it can be useful um, to, to adversaries. But well, we shouldn't have been there in the first place. This is the other part of this. So, yeah, all that stuff's great. Um, the NSA leaks, I'm fine with that. 
helping Snowden escape to China than Russia. And then setting up a broadcasting relationship with the Russian government, uh, doing stuff on RT America, promising Russia and China leaks, and yet mysteriously never coming up with them. Um, most notably, talking a really big game about China or Russia leaks. I want to say it was in 2011. It might have been, it, it was either December of 2011 or December of 2012. And then, boom, changing his tune uh, as though someone had gotten to him. Uh, so the, it's interesting because he then changes. Now he talks about like birth rates being weird. Uh, there's the, I have an old tweet of his, the, what I call Assange math, where he's breaking down European and American white baby birth rates and stuff. Like he, he's gotten into some weird politics ever since he went all isolated and hermited in the uh, Uruguay embassy, which is also probably set up to him set up for him as a proxy by the russians he's got some sort of relationship with the russian government i'll just cut to the chest um and then he clearly was helping the trump campaign win the election uh, and so if you want to understand what assange's political aims are whatever they are and i think you know part of it is not necessarily clearly left right in an american sense but whatever they are they involve a transaction with the like make america america again white identity guy donald trump and other people like marine le pen and that sort of thing too so i don't know i don't think julian assange is really like the left friend and if assange ends up getting a pardon it's not because trump Watch the collateral murder video back in 2008 was like, oh my God, we're committing war atrocities in Iraq. You know how I know this? Because he just fucking pardoned war criminals, right? <laughs> of a piece. We can use one thing for context for another thing. <laughs> so by process of elimination here, by looking at his own actions, the only thing that Trump would be pardoning Assange for is if you believe that Assange and WikiLeaks were part of an effort to help Trump and his campaign win the 2016 election and harm Hillary Clinton's campaign. That would be the reason he would pardon Julian Assange. Um, that's the stuff that I actually think Julian Assange should 100% face charges for. The stuff he should be pardoned for he won't be well. He will be pardoned for that. That'll be used as the smoke screen. Um, th but there is there's some things that he should be pardoned for. But then there are other things he should still totally 100 percent absolutely face charges for. Um, but if he gets pardoned, if Assange gets pardoned, it will be because yeah, him and Russia. He was part of that liaisoning of the Russian hack from the DNC, laundering it through WikiLeaks. Assange knew. Assange timed it to help Trump and hurt Clinton. He had a clear side in that election and that side and that political goal of Julian Assange. I just want to make this clear because for some, it not even necessarily saying any of y'all listening to the show at this point, but there are still some people who it's just not sinking in. One of Julian Assange's political goals in 2016 was to get Donald Trump elected. He inflicted that on the United States. So as we're going through the coronavirus special response, as Trump's talking about injecting bleach, as he's pardoning war criminals. Remember, Julian Assange wanted that. Julian Assange wanted that for us. So thank you, Julian Assange. Thank you very, very much. You, you've done a great job bringing peace to the world by inflicting Donald Trump on the United States. Uh, clearly, clearly good. Uh, thank God we dodged that Hillary bullet. Um, and that gets us to the next person, Snowden. Um, if Snowden gets pardoned, I don't know what to make of this. Because I think that it's entirely possible that at some point Snowden linked up with the Russian government um, in a more formal way during the process of that NSA thing. It's not just like he was he got... Assange set up the relationship and then Snowden did something. But then I also go, Snowden made some sort of transaction here with the Russians to secure safe harbor in Russia. And I feel fairly confident about that because 
if Putin wanted to help out Trump, he would have delivered Snowden on a silver platter to Trump. And if Putin wanted to facilitate like some sort of diplomacy or transaction with the United States and it was a Democrat who was president, he would have delivered Snowden on a silver platter to Hillary Clinton. Um, he, he would have used Snowden as a chip. But for the fact that Snowden, I think, gave Putin something. Um, you know, Snowden contends to this day, well, there's never been any evidence of that demonstrated. Fair play to him on that. I, I just, something's never felt right about that. Uh, and if he gets pardoned, it will make me think probably that he's more guilty of something rather than less guilty of something based on who Donald Trump a person who's pardoned fewer people than James A. Garfield and has pardoned more corrupt people proportionally, uh, probably than any president. I, I think you, you know, it gets a little bit nebulous how you put together that metric, but eh, probably really to that argument. If Stone gets pardoned, eh, I, I'll be fine with it. It's I'll have mixed feelings about it, um, th to say the least. But uh, unless or until they can demonstrate something more compelling about snowden's bad acting um and how snowden has been a bad actor if he has been a bad actor um all i can do is go well and pardon him for releasing the nsa documents because that stuff was valuable the fact that the american people were apathetic to it um just yeah we're almost done here this is part of why i've been so cynical about like power of the people stuff you know sandersism and like oh we need to Take it to the streets, general strike, any of that stuff. I'm just going to go about that shit because I remember when the NSA stuff got put out there. And it was your government is fucking spying on you. And I went to this Restore the Fourth rally with uh, the now elsewhere Jordan Williams. Um, and we were at this restore the fourth rally that was organized i remember getting on message boards going and going to jay i was like dude this this is this is gonna be cool we'll meet some like-minded people we went down there like 10 fucking people city of dallas city of dallas fifth largest media market in the country like 10 people no one gave a shit uh i remember the occupy encampment that had a couple hundred people a little bit better um back in the day but people can't get shaken from their stupor uh, so it does, it makes me really cynical. Um, but I, I do want to end this episode here uh, on this note, which is that I hope to God that reality winner gets a pardon. And I don't expect it to come from Donald Trump because reality winner released information that was hurtful to Donald Trump and helpful to the American people. It's kind of like, uh, kind of like an Ed Snowden without any of the problems. Maybe is a good way of understanding reality winner. So I hope that she gets a pardon. And I hope that people start, uh, especially, boy, loud voices on the left who have put a ton of energy into calling for Snowden and Assange to get pardons. I would love if maybe like a third of that energy was put into calling for reality winner's pardon because she deserves it 100%. Absolutely. Uh, she deserves the legal defense fund. Absolutely. Because she's she actually tried to release information, tried to get it to The Intercept. Glenn Greenwald and The Intercept somehow couldn't take care of reality winner the same way that they took care of Ed Snowden. She's the one who needs the pardon. She's the one who needs the pardon. Anyways, I think that's going to do it for this episode. Don't worry about the government. My name is Chris Novembrino. I think we'll get one more out here before we move into 2021. I'll, I'll write something up here. I, I like getting out and chatting with y'all more than once every 14 days but you know december needed to get some time off to myself spend some time with the cats settle into the new job all that sort of stuff if you want to follow me slash the show go and follow at dwatg as of january 1st 2021 at chris novembrino is disabled gone deleted from the interwebs i know uh, it's a big move, clearing my head, trying to make 2021 a fresh start in so many different ways. I know some of y'all are too, um, and we're going to do it together. Wanted to say real quickly here, um, as I am taping this episode, this episode is in part, I mean, it's not like, it's not like the guy has, you know, passed on to the great beyond or anything like that, but uh, my boy T. Willie 
if you are listening to this podcast, I hope you are on your way and recovering from COVID-19. Um, we've had a number of people, Brian Alberson has had COVID-19. We've had a number of people associated with the show um, have COVID-19 here. Um, listeners have COVID-19. Uh, Cody ha- had a bout with COVID-19. Um, it's it's a serious deal. Uh, I remember T telling me that uh, this like first comment is, you know, I, I was aware of the symptoms, obviously. It's not like we don't talk about COVID-19 on Don't Worry About the Government. Um, and also there are better places to get information from, than from this show. Um, but, but, you know, he took it seriously, but the symptoms were worse than he even expected. So anyways, I hope you're recovering. I hope that listening to this show uh, rejuvenated you and brought you your spirits back. I, I hope that I'm like the Moderna of podcasts is what I am. No, no, I'm not. Anyways, at DWATG. Buck a show is all we ask these holiday seasons. Um, if you can, donate to your local food bank, too. Um, but then if you got a buck to spare and you've been enjoying these podcasts all year, I love getting them out to you. you need to make sure that uh, you know, I continue to pay the bills. I've also got a job um, and you know, just got to make sure everything makes dollars and cents. A buck a show is all I'm asking for these commentaries that I write up here. Go to patreon.com slash DWATG or paypal.me or yeah, paypal.me slash DWATG. Um, and you can also do the cash app, the cash app there. It's a cash tag dollar sign, uh, Chris Nov N O V. So those are the three ways you can uh, get money to the show. If you choose to do PayPal or cash app, I put you on like a little mailing list. I shoot you an email, all that on Patreon. You get the video feed. So if you ever want to watch the video show, you want to get a little bit of video extra. Like we did 25 minutes of extra here on this show and went through and I talked about all of my different guitars. So you get the video side of it, which can be cool. Um, you, it can be cool. I, I you know, I, I don't know how cool I am, um, but you do get to see the guitars and stuff. Occasionally cats wander into the frame, which is exciting. My bed's in the picture. Who, who doesn't want to see what Chris's uh, queen size bed looks like? Good stuff. It really is. Uh, anyways, support the show. I want to thank you all so much for doing it. Uh, I hope, you guys have been safe during this holiday season. Uh, we're almost through 2020. We're almost through the Trump presidency. Uh, it, there, I would, I'm not going to say light at the end of the tunnel. I, I, w- but at least we're on less bumpy road. And, uh, you know, that's cool. Um, so thank you guys so much for listening to the show. And until the next one, bye-bye.